the first author I really became a fanboy of was this man, Ashwin Sanghi. He's been on my list of potential podcast guests for the longest time. And this conversation was deep. It was extremely grey. You know, in an era where the internet only understands black or white, Ashwin Sanghi and Ranvi spoke about all the greys in our world, our country, our sense of spirituality, our sense of psychology, our sense of ourselves. Deep, fun conversation. Authors always give us the best podcast because in order to become a popular mainstream author, you've also got to read a lot of books yourself. You've got to hoard a lot of knowledge. And therefore, you turn into one of the best possible guests that a podcast could have. Remember, follow TRS on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive now, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This is Ashwin Sanghi on The Renvi Show. Ashwin Sanghi, sir. Welcome to The Renvi Show. So delighted to be here, Ranveer. Uh, you know, I keep uh, I keep watching your podcasts, and I realize that uh, even though you claim that uh, you were probably one of my earliest readers, yeah. it's taken you a bloody long time to call me on your show. <laughs> you've been you've been a dream guest for us. See, writers generally are dream guests because you all have the history in your own life of reading a lot. I think that's what creates a good writer when you read a lot. Secondly, the first book I ever read end to end in my life was Chanakya's Chant. So like it, uh, the just, I mean, the way you had written it with that much pace and those many details gripped me and I was like, okay, this is the true joy of reading. So genuinely, I know it's a little unbelievable, but you were very early on in my list of guests. I'm delighted to be here and I'm really, truly touched and delighted. I'm glad so. Uh, I liked how we met in the morning today. I'm just yeah. like sitting out in my balcony doing my pranayam. Absolutely. And then you're just you're just like kind of gauging. In fact, I didn't want to disturb you because <laughs> I know how important those moments when one is in pranayam or dhyan, uh, actually just stillness. Mm. Uh, because it's so completely missing in our lives, right? So that's the reason I was standing at the edge just looking at you for a while. <laughs> uh, it was a matter of chance that you opened your eyes. I felt I felt some happy energy walking towards me. But that's 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 honestly what I want to say to you. And that's what I was holding back until this moment now that we're recording. Um, you seem to have one of the happiest energies I've come across on this show and generally in the recent past. So does that come from the world of being a writer? Because... I've been to Devdak Pat Patnaik's house. I've spoken a lot to Amish the party. So Dr. Radha Krishnan Pillai is a mentor of mine. And now I meet you. And the common trait between all of y'all is that y'all are extremely contented, peaceful, happy human beings who are still kind of living the life of a child in your heads. Probably because of your writing, probably because yeah. of the creativity that has to be activated. Sure. But uh, even, even when you speak, there's a lot of happiness in your eyes. And at this stage of my life, happiness has become a strong goal for me. Yeah. So what's the secret? I think for the, you know, as as you know, uh, for those who are aware of the background of Ashwin Sanghi, uh, I spent the better part of my childhood uh, training to be a businessman. Mm. I was born in a Banya Marwadi family. And as you know, that in, a, in the culture of uh, a Marwadi family, uh, when a child is born, particularly a boy, the two most important words uh, that he must learn, other than... Uh, uh, mama, papa is probably debit and credit. <laughs> uh, so you, you know, I mean, you grew up in an environment where those are the two most important. Once you've learned that, you your vocabulary is actually complete. <laughs> uh, and when I was writing uh, a novel uh, called The Vault of Vishnu, mm. there was a very interesting little uh, nugget of wisdom that I uh, gained about the merchants of Samarkand. The mm. ancient Silk Road. Mm. And the merchants had this wonderful tradition that when a child would be born in their home, uh, they would touch a drop of honey to his tongue and a drop of glue to his palm. The idea was that when the child grows up, he should have a sweet tongue so that he can sell anything to anyone. Mm. And he should have a sticky palm so that gold coins would stick <laughs> to the palm. So in that sense... Uh, the Banya or Marwadi culture is not very different. Mm. So that was my training. That was what I was 
uh, really sort of uh, expected to to be involved in i had a couple of years ago a very interesting moment i was on a holiday and i was sitting in the garden of the hotel it was the 31st of december and i was waiting for the new year to kick in where was this this was in jaipur mm. on the lawns of the rambagh palace mm. and i was waiting for uh, you know thinking to myself i said okay you know ashwin you've achieved quite a lot in your life but what is it that you really want and i realized it wasn't about money it wasn't about fame it was about happiness wanting to be happy wanting to be content and so i started putting down a list of points and you know i love thinking in terms of formulas mm. so i was wondering that if happiness is the dependent variable then what is the independent variable for happiness what what is that function what is that mathematical function and you know ranveer it was very strange i could count all the independent variables on one hand number one i realized that yes money cannot make you happy but a certain level of wealth and financial security is necessary so that you can have the freedom to do what you want the second thing i realized was that you not only want yourself to be healthy but you want everyone else around you to be healthy the idea being that today if you have a really close family member uh, who god forbid has cancer how can your happiness not be affected at that point of time the third thing i realized is that you need to have a purpose an outlet i mean for me if i get up in the morning at 5 o'clock i am raring to go because i know that today i need to write chapter 36 and this is what happens in that chapter and this is how these characters uh, will react in that chapter so that's very important having a purpose in your life i would say the fourth is relationships probably in terms of having loved ones whether it's your parents whether it's your siblings whether it is your children your wife your spouse uh um, it could be a spiritual guru it could be your closest friends it could be your childhood friends uh but those relationships are what makes life worth living mm. i mean you could be very famous but if you don't have anyone who can turn you turn around and pat you on the back and say beta i'm so proud of you then what is your life really worth mm. and finally i would say probably it is that feeling that there is some greater power than you which is controlling your life i would say that's the fifth that you may not believe in allah you may not believe in ram krishna you may not believe in brahma vishnu mahesh or lakshmi saraswati kali you may not believe in jesus christ as being the son of god uh you may be a physicist and you may say may say that the universe came from a event known as the big bang that happened 13 billion years ago if you have the ability to question yourself that okay if the big bang happened then what was there before the big bang or if it came from a single point of energy then what was that single point of energy mm. that there is some greater hand that is directing the universe and what is happening within the universe and what is giving you creativity and what is giving you creativity so i would say that probably if you can handle these five things then probably you'll be a happier person mm. I can vouch for the fact that you at least give out a lot of happiness, so I'm sure that's coming from a place of internal. No, partly happiness. that's also because I'm happy to be here with oh, you. Thank, thank you, sir. But generally, like you know, you have a lot of joy in your eyes when you speak, especially yeah. about writing. And absolutely, as a podcast, I'm always looking for the moments where my guest has a lot of joy in the eyes because that's usually the subject. Then that'll give me the most uh, kind of absolutely. meat on the podcast. What I liked about something you said outside is. I pitched that we should do a topic related to ancient Indian culture, maybe something in Hinduism. And you said, no, no, no. We should do something which is an overlap between ancient Indian culture yeah. and the sciences, yeah. quantum physics, etc. Absolutely. So I have a simple but profound question for you. Sure. Which is that Big Bang thing you spoke about? About three or four years ago, uh, there was uh, an event known as the Penguin Annual Lecture. Mm. and the keynote speaker for that event was dan brown and then penguin came back to me and said ashwin he will deliver a 20 minute talk and then can we have a 40 minute discussion between you and dan brown uh in terms of the stuff that interests you guys mm. i said of course i'll be happy to so we went away to the oberoi and we sat down for dinner after a couple of drinks dan asked me he said what do you consider to be god 
what is your definition of God? I called for a pad and pen and I wrote down on that G is equal to infinity minus K. Mm. And I passed it on to him. And he said, now you have to explain what this means. I said, think of it mathematically. G is what we call God. What we consider divine. Infinity is the whole universe, the Brahmand. Uh, the word Brahmand comes to you from Brahm, creation, and Anda, the egg-shaped universe. Mm. So the creation of the universe. So everything that has existed, that exists, that will exist in, in every possible dimension at every point of time is the Brahmand. Mm. And then K is the extent of human knowledge. What do we know? So God is everything that is there, less what we know. So he said, but why do you say that? I said, think about the Egyptians. The Egyptians, they saw the sun rise in the east and set in the west. Mm. They didn't know what it was. So they said, this is Ra, the sun god. And he gets up in the morning and he travels across the skies in his chariot. And then by the evening he is tired, so he goes to sleep. And that's when night occurs. Mm. And then later on you had uh, Aryabhat and Copernicus and Galileo coming up with their theories and telling us that, hey, listen, you know what? The sun is a giant ball of fire and the earth revolves around it. And so the day and night is created as a result of that. Mm. And by the spinning of the earth on its axis. Uh, and suddenly, poor Ra lost his divinity. Because now we could suddenly explain it. So in effect, to my mind, whatever we can't explain, we attribute to God. Mm. G is equal to infinity minus K. The more we can explain, the less room we leave for God. Yeah. True knowledge is knowing that you know nothing. That you know nothing. I want to ask the 50-something version of you that. What is your 50s like? What is a person's 50s like? Because we usually know about what 20s are like, what 30s are like. But I'm assuming by that by the time you're in your 50s, you're also observing life around you, observing the life of your friends. And then where do you equate this God angle in your 50s? Because, because I'm assuming that it becomes stronger for a lot of people. Like people kind of become more spiritual as they age. But I want to know the breakdown of that. Well, I would say that if you're lucky, then you begin to understand what is of value to you in your life. And that's subjective. That's and that's subjective. It can be different for different people. I mean, my, uh, my, uh, you know, my entry into the world of writing happened as a result of my maternal grand uncle. Uh, I mentioned to you that I came from a business background, uh, and uh, my maternal grand uncle lived in Kanpur, uh, and he himself was a businessman. He ran several textile mills, so he was very wealthy in his own right. Uh, but the one thing that he was also in his parallel life was a scholar, a poet. He was multilingual. He spoke Sanskrit, Urdu, English, French, Latin. I mean, uh, he was truly in that sense a remarkable scholar. Mm. And uh, he had this wonderful library where he had some 8,000, 10,000 books. And he would very lovingly pick one book every week and send it to me. You know, when I go to my father's office, the Munimji always tells me that I should be focusing on bookkeeping rather than book reading. Mm. And that the only thing worth reading is a balance sheet. And he would tell me, he would say, Beta, remember one thing that you have been born in a business background family. So doing puja on Diwali of Lakshmi Ji is going to come naturally to you. That's something that you are uh, born and brought up with. He said, but remember one thing that the relationship between Lakshmi and Saraswati is very strange. Mm. He said, if, uh, if Saraswati happens to be sitting in this room, then Lakshmi ji comes into this room because she's curious about where Saraswati is. Mm. And if Saraswati gets up and leaves from this room, then Lakshmi also gets up because she's curious, where is she gone? So he said, even if your objective in life is to run after Lakshmi, he said, the short, short way is to uh, go after Saraswati. Mm. Because if Saraswati is here, Lakshmi will also come. 
and he said remember one thing in our mythology the only deity that can keep both these devi ji's together is ganesh he said he can have lakshmi on one side and he can have saraswati on one side and he sits virajman in the middle mm. so he said if you want to live your life then live your life like ganesh which ranveer probably explains why ashwin sanghi looks the way he does because i have lived my life like ganesh which is what which is in other words understanding that there is always a middle ground our world unfortunately uh, ranveer is one where we are very happy to compartmentalize thinking this guy is a rightist this guy is a leftist mm. this guy is secular this guy is communal this guy is a liptard this guy is a bhakt mm. um uh, uh this this person uh is a uh, fundamentally a uh, uh, uh of a view where uh, everything uh, that is ancient indian uh should be discarded whereas this guy is a complete rationalist mm. why do we create compartments isn't it possible to to not be in any compartment you know i'd written a very interesting book called keepers of the kal chakra and uh in keepers of the kal chakra what i was talking about was the fact that a lot of the stuff that our ancient rishis and munis were seeing was very similar to the stuff that modern quantum theorists are talking about do you think that people around you like in in their 50s like your friends who you observe who may not be at the level of happiness you are at kind of feed into this idea of compartmentalization oh absolutely because that's that's what our generation feels about your generation yeah but but the the point is that in fact it's very easy to get caught up into that compartmentalization trap mm. and that's what's happening to most people that at a given phase in their lives they feel that oh this is the end all and be all if you had asked me uh, when i was a student at st xavier's college uh, studying economics uh, my end all and be all was that i need to go for an mba to an ivy league institution and i went to yale uh and at w- once i was at yale then the end all and be all was that i need to be a tremendous biz- business success so i need to make lots of money mm. and that's what i did for the next 15 odd years uh when i decided to step out of the world of business the entire focus was that okay listen you know uh uh in the world of creativity how can i make a name for myself so even though i didn't admit it to myself but the truth was i was searching for that elusive fame Mm. It's over a period of time that you realize that you are looking for so much more. You know, in the world of writing, I'm always called the overlap guy. Uh, but but I realized that that was actually what I also wanted in my real life. Mm. That I wanted my family life also, and I wanted those little material pleasures also, mm. and I wanted a little bit of fame also, and I wanted a little bit of health also, and I wanted a little bit of financial security also. Mm. It was almost like uh, uh, Gautam Buddha saying that walk the middle path. I think it's called Zorba Buddha. This, All, this, absolutely. This, this thing. Absolutely. Have you heard of the Zorba Buddha? The, the or or the so-called noble eightfold path mm. that that hey listen you know I mean to to my mind I think if you can have a little bit of everything it's far better than having lots of one thing. Now if I'm meeting you for the first time it's a very important moment in my career. When I woke up in the morning today, um, I got just a voice in my head. I don't know whether it was the carryover from a dream or what happened, but um, the the voice in my head said, "Speak about Maya today. Speak yeah. about simulation." Yeah, and I didn't understand why because that's not what I had planned to speak on with you. I right. told you in the balcony what I wanted yeah. to speak yeah, about yeah, with you. Yeah, of course. Uh, have you been thinking about simulation? Why did I get that intuition? Because my morning intuitions are very strong, and it's a big part of this podcast as well. Sure, Ma- no, and I- and may- maybe it ties into this whole angle of happiness. That yeah. why is someone else's Maya unhappy? Like I see, I yeah. see. Maybe ninety percent of the people your age that I've met in urban centers, and I don't think the same for like small towns in India. I think people yeah. they are happier, yeah. but in urban centers, ninety percent of the people your age are unhappy. So yeah. what's gone wrong in that Maya? No, I I think I think to a very great extent, I believe that in larger larger towns and cities, there is there is that old English proverb of keeping up with the Jones, 
uh, where to a certain extent you peg your own self worth based on what others think of you comparing yourself to others the comparisons mm. uh and i don't know to my mind i am now convinced that that, that is the sure shot path to unhappiness mm. uh where uh where you are unhappy even though you have a flourishing business you are unhappy because someone has a business which is twice your size or mm. thrice your size mm. uh or for example you have a very comfortable car to travel in but you are unhappy because someone you know has just picked up a BMW 7 series mm. uh or uh to a very great extent uh you 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 have the most wonderful life partner in your spouse but you look at the the page 3 model that someone else has and you say well you know wouldn't it be nice if i had that arm candy mm. there is no end to this uh ranveer there is no end to that comparison and one also needs to be able to come to terms with the fact that be happy that it's there because it may not be there tomorrow i also want to talk about sadness in the same equation like you spoke about comparison leading to sadness so i think of the people who have that comparison mindset and with while they're comparing themselves to others what will actually be giving these people happiness it can't be that material gain or you know the fame gain or any any kind of gain because no matter how much gain they get they will compare themselves to someone else yeah but i feel the moments that make these kind of people happy are when their thought narratives are validated yeah through polarized media Hmm. which and and this is a strong reason why so many people our age don't uh, follow the news as closely as they should yeah. because they see an entire parents generation kind of taken over by news and i think following the news is important yeah. but from a bunch of sources actually dr cool. radhakrishnan pele spoke about this that yeah. you need to read the left wing uh, yeah. piece on it you need of to read course. the right wing you need to read the apolitical piece on it i have long maintained that you know politics is tomorrow's history hmm uh and what we read as history today was yesterday's politics mm. um but the world of history what is it other than a fable that has been agreed upon yeah uh and But, history is always written by the victors exactly uh today you um, i think it was a, a william dalrymple uh who said that uh who in in one of his books he said that we've not taught colonial history and the horrors of colonialism to the vast majority of english students so in other words their version of history is very different to ours mm. you take a single event like let's say the great mutiny what we call the 1857 revolt we teach uh, teach it in india as the great rebellion of 1857 where the sepoys rose up in rebellion where they do teach it in europe it is known as the sepoy mutiny of 1857 it's the same event but a very very different lens has been applied on that same event so it was uh, george santena uh, who said that history is a pack of lies about events that never happened written by people who were never there mm. it is colored by the observer people who say that history is unbiased don't know what they are talking about there's no way to prevent your bias from creeping in to a narrative you know the one thing that is truly amazing about dharmic thought is its essential pluralism you can have 33 million deities which are part of the same narrative uh you may look at a stone and you may say that this is a shivling and i may look at that shivling and i may call it a stone mm. but we are both equally welcome you could be astic i could be nastic we are we are part of the same plural system someone may worship shiva someone may worship shakti i wrote chanakya's chant which is one of your favorite books but chanakya if you look at his life and if you look at his writings uh you could call him the greatest statesman you could call him one of the best strategists you could call him a great political economist of his time but you could also call him a male chauvinist pig because his views on women were extremely derogative uh, der uh, derogatory because of the times that he lived in uh, you could also consider him to be an extremely evil person in terms of the kootniti 
that he uh, prophesizes what is that so kootniti basically comes down to samdan uh, samdan dand bhed uh, and that at the end of the day uh, the ends are more important than the means like achieve a win no matter what it exactly. is exactly and that is the way that we need to start looking at narratives yeah. especially political narratives i think that's especially political that's narratives. the cause of so much hate within people's hearts uh, and and i'm not just talking about you know when i say hate within people's hearts lots of people pictureize i mean visualize people from the interiors of the country right yeah, yeah those people have hate in their hearts no no, no, no you'll no. be sitting in this city absolutely and you will also have hate in your heart if you're that into the political narratives that we are fed through mainstream media in every atheist there is some part of him that is itching to believe mm. and in every believer there is some part of him or her that is itching to doubt we need to allow those to get free reign mm. the idea being that even though i may be a devout hindu there is nothing which says that i should not be able to doubt my beliefs and the same should apply in every religion this is very important in today's world uh and genuinely if we are looking at let's say the next 50 odd years i think the only way that this world will be able to uh see peace and stability is in case all of us are willing to get up and question and stand up and and doubt our own faith mm. faiths faiths speaking about faiths so uh, you said something very interesting you said that abrahamic thought processes are kind of copy pasting themselves onto eastern thought processes like Correct. ours so we uh, we went to the kal bhairav mandir in banaras and we made a vlog on it and we spoke about a kind of heartfelt experience about it now the shiv puran has one story about the kal bhairav and the vishnu puran has another story about kal bhairav we stuck to the shiv puran story because it's banaras you know shiv ji is like the ishta dev of most people there and all the vishnu puran people get offended with it we bring on iskon monks who are uh, obviously kind of vishnu bhakts Bhakt. and uh, the the shiv puran people say that no why are you only bringing on yeah. iskon people why not bring people from the uh, shiva way of looking at things correct and this is what i mean that why can't we just accept everyone else let's speak about just hinduism sure you know i'm i'm a very very proud indian first yeah. i'm very proud of my religion my dharm my culture but man i see so much hate around me and yeah. it's it's not just hate for other religions it's also hate amongst each other yeah like yeah. as in you'll you'll hate other hindus for just having a slightly different thought process than yeah. yours there's so much hate directed at even someone like devdatt patna yeah who talks about pl- uh, the plural way of looking at yeah. things that the same uh, version of stories can be viewed in multiple ways yeah. i personally believe algorithms are to blame here and i say that because um I don't know who it was. It was someone who was carrying out an experiment. I think someone from the world of social media, where they said that you just try interacting with some hardcore right wing pages, and the algorithm will learn that oh, okay, this person likes being fed right wing politics. So he'll feed you more. Yeah, and the system and will feed you more. The system will feed you more, and they'll they'll feed you such negative narratives about other religions that you'll really begin to hate the other yeah, religion. Yeah, of course. There'll be videos of some. someone in uh, a gulf country killing a kid and all yeah. that and they'll say oh, you know they'll demonize islam generally yes. which is not which is not the right way of looking at other yes. people in the world absolutely um you know my my question is one where do you see us going as like carriers of the hindu faith and you are one of those people yes like there's so many hindu elements in your writing as well of course um you know so somewhere i feel that as media professionals as creative professionals we pass on the baton but i don't know where we are going as hindu culture But i think what has happened to a what my effort has been ranveer is to basically try and explain the fact that uh even though we consider religions to be sort of compartmentalized but the truth of the matter is that there are there are far more things that connect us mm. similarly take for example in the world of hindu uh, faith uh, you have trinities right lakshmi saraswati kali brahma vishnu mahesh but even in christianity you have the father the son and the holy ghost now you consider that if you were to take the male trinity and female trinity in hinduism uh, and depict 
them as triangles lakshmi saraswati kali and brahma vishnu mahesh bring the two triangles together what will you get a six pointed star Mm. you see the six pointed star along with the om symbol very often in mandirs outside mandirs you will see this as a repeat swastika om and the six pointed star you see it in several mandirs particularly in the south then you go back to judaism and you have the star of david which is a six pointed star so did they evolve independently or was there some was there some interchange was there some borrowing of knowledge happening between the two faiths i have a lot of parsi friends grown up around parsis and they constantly told me while i was growing up that there's too many parallels between the hindu faith and the parsi faith of course and I've, as i've grown up i've begun like studying it a little more and that's true yeah i also we had i can't remember who on the show uh, it was a writer i believe who said that in in parsis there's a word called ahura yeah and in our like philosophies as a word called asura correct and there's some linkage between those words yes. where for us in our uh, uh, cultural teachings we talk about asuras as the enemies of the devs and similarly similarly there's a parallel there where they look at the heroes as ahuras and then there is like enemies which i think they it's something from d i can't remember sure. the word um but there is some linkage between even ancient subcontinental culture which is india pakistan Absolutely. afghanistan and then central asia of course it which is. is parsis which makes me think that maybe it was one origin group well you you think about this no that when when we are talking about the so called vedic expanse mm. and uh, uh, trust me i'm i'm not attempting to uh, attempting to to color it in any way no, no. but whether it was india whether it was pakistan whether it was afghanistan whether it was iran whether it was central europe and whether it was further southeast from india whether it was malaysia cambodia vietnam and all of that i consider it to have been one great vedic expanse mm. uh today some some of the uh, uh i mean if you uh, go back into let's say afghanistan today we see it as a as fundamentally an islamic or a muslim nation but uh, uh when uh, when uh, yun sang visited uh, india and came through afghanistan uh, he was just fascinated because at every at every 10 steps there was a buddhist stupa or a monastery some of the most remarkable monasteries were there mm. for me it is very interesting that you have on the one hand in zoroastrianism you have ahura and we have asura but ahuras are the good guys ahura mazda is the great one mm. uh and on the other hand the asuras uh are actually the negative forces mm. uh, as in, far as in in our ancient subjective reality they are negative in our subjective reality they are negative mm. but uh actually if you now again that that will lead me into a completely different discussion that actually that that by uh, that binary approach to asura deva is actually not really relevant because some of the greatest asuras uh were actually worshiped why why don't we actually go into that tangent because so, of the podcast <laughs> yeah but but the point is that from from the angle of on the one hand you have this asura ahura divide and on the other hand you have the daiva and the deva divide daiva was the word daiva was the zoroastrian word mm. which uh, was basically talking about guys like uh, uh the indra Uh, mm. and those were the negative forces i also i feel that the the narrative that should be put across here is that uh, while it's very good to be proud of your own country's culture and hinduism in general we can't always assume that hindu hinduism is the seed of everything else oh absolutely that there, there would have been a huge interplay yeah there would have like today for example if you take let's say the concept of vegetarianism uh within the world of hinduism to a very great extent the world of vegetarianism in hinduism would have been influenced by buddhism, buddhism yeah so each religion has in some ways played on the other uh, read the sermon on the mount uh, and the beatitudes uh, in the new testament uh, and they read like a lot of the teachings of the buddha mm. um and uh, you know for example uh, there is a monastery uh, in uh, Ladakh which is known as Hemis and uh, a Russian explorer by the name of Nicholas Notovich uh had landed up there in the 19th century 
and he was injured his foot was injured as a result of which he had to stay in hemis for a far longer time uh, to wait for his leg to heal and the chief lama out there showed him a scroll and the scroll talked about a young boy called isa uh, who had uh, come to study under the buddhist masters uh, and he apparently came from a distant land called judea mm. uh, now in the in the bible we have a specific period of time which is known as the lost years of christ which is between the ages of 12 and 30 uh because at age 12 we see christ has walked into the synagogue uh and has actually been able to uh teach even at that young age and then we see him re-entering uh judea in at the age of 30 but we don't know what happens between those in those 18 odd years mm. and that fits into a piece of that puzzle that could it be that he could have actually taken some of his wisdom under the buddhist masters in our country we are proud of the fact that for every bhimsen joshi uh we have a zakir hussain we are proud that for a vikram sarabhai we have an abdul kalam for a shashi tharur we have a salman rashdi that is the gagga jamuna tehzeeb we have all grown up with that but if ganga jamuna tehzeeb is an indication of the genetic character of the subcontinent then ask yourself why did it not take root in bangladesh or pakistan the underlying answer will be clear that if the ethos is plural i e hindu that hindu ethos ingrains a respect for pluralism for other faiths for other faiths that is very important the moment islamization creeps in which is what happened with our two neighbors whether it was earlier pakistan or whether it was bangladesh later the ganga chamuna tehzeeb was gone look around you at the 49 islamic countries and there is no scope for ganga jamuna so if you truly want that there should be secularism then you need to preserve the dharmic ethos you have to understand what that means which should even make us turn inwards and if there are hindu brothers and sisters who are accusing other faiths of being below them we need to say hold on you need to have a sense of equality when it look when you're looking at other faiths equality but at the end of the day with every with every technology you have a version 2.1 2.2 you have an update your software needs to get updated regularly the same applies with faith and unfortunately there are a bunch of people who are keeping that faith at version 1.0 mm. why is it not possible for me to be secular and still be proud of being a hindu why should i be called a bhakt mm. for being proud of my hindu roots mm. why is it not possible for me to be someone who believes that law and order is of paramount importance but at the end of the day i still feel that the justice system needs reform yeah it's it's social media sir we're living in like the the age of the internet and that's what's kind no, of but governing. at times it gets tiring ranveer it, yeah. it it gets tiring because there are people like you and me who want who do not want to be boxed in even as a writer i started out writing books which became very famous in the world of history mythology people started saying oh ye he to is a mythological writer <laughs> in order to show that i am not a mythological writer i wrote two crime thrillers with james patterson which had no mythology in them mm. then people said he's a crime writer in order to prove them wrong i started writing the 13 step series which was the world of non fiction and self help mm. because i was so terrified of being boxed in mm. i the same applies to my own life i don't want to be boxed in mm. and i do believe that at the end of the day faith is something that should be in your living room it should be in your heart it should be in your puja it should be on your prayer mat it should not be outside
what i liked about this conversation was that we spoke about multiple religions multiple angles on it how at the end of the day the world is one big family how every single religion in the modern day has kind of begun from the same offshoot absolutely which, or borrowed yeah or borrowed like ideas you know which have kind of crossed culture but i also like that you highlight uh, the fact that we need to get updated and uh, after speaking to yourself and all the writers we've had on the show i have understood how you guys package your ideologies into stories and then sell them to the world and for the people who can read between the lines they pick up on what the writer's heart actually says and for the rest of the masses these are just stories the one thing i've realized over the last couple of years from my own life of doing business and you know trying to create so there's an app we're creating called level which is centered around meditation and fitness okay how beautiful yeah and uh, i'm an editor in my heart right like i'm a youtuber i love editing videos i'm a, i'm a writer i write my own scripts creating this app was like a two year long edit or two year long script writing process wow. i'm taking all the creativity and experiences and learnings and packaging them into this technology based product yeah. it's it's tested me as a creative professional it's tested me as a business person and what i've learned now is that my 30s need to be about storytelling and film making and i need to feed into the creativity because the same joy you have in your eyes mr sanghi i wish to have in my eyes when i'm your age yeah but it's already there in your eyes when you are doing the session for example yeah. i find you know ultimately uh, ranveer we are all storytellers mm. we are all we are all storytellers you mean humans are storytellers we we all tell our story in different ways i i have a 3 year old golden retriever his name is simba he when i come come into the house in the evening everyone else ignores me he will be jumping up and down he will be wagging his tail he will be pawing at me that listen i want to be loved and he tells me a story through those actions through those gestures he's telling me how much i love you why can't you love me back the same amount mm uh when a politician gets up modi ji is one of the greatest uh in some ways i would consider him to be one of the best orators we've had in our times it's probably the core of his powers as well core right? of his power as well I but mean, uh, ultimately what is he doing he's mm. he's spinning you a narrative yeah Oh uh, and and I would say the same for Trump gaining power in the US. He did the same for US but citizens. But the greatest politicians whether it was Indira Gandhi, whether it was Trump, whether it was John F Kennedy, all of them without doubt were wonderful storytellers. I want to highlight something here. Um I asked you in the morning how you came across my work and you highlighted the conversation with Gaur Gopal Das Prabhu. Yes. for me as a podcast i gain from each conversation yes. what i gain from that was a ton of things including spiritual wisdom yes but as a brand when i observed gaur gopal das prabhu i thought to myself that the separating factor for him is that he's saying some very deep stuff but beginning it with a story exactly and and i started incorporating that into all my creative work and i saw that our numbers rose because of absolutely. that absolutely my writing became better absolutely so you know people ask me they say uh ashwin how do you go about telling a story and uh, you know how, what is involved in that it must be so complex and i say you know what when i am writing a novel i don't think i'm writing a novel in fact the one thing that i don't do is writing mm uh i have always believed that i am not a writer i am a storyteller and what does that imply I think that I am sitting inside a room and there is a circle of 10 friends around me and main unko ek bahut hi interesting dilchasp kahani bata raha hu I'm narrating it and these 10 people you know uh, I'm sorry I take these little side trips but the great bollywood uh, the great hollywood director alfred hitchcock he said that the length or the duration of a film is related to the endurance of the human bladder so you can only have a film which is as long as the capacity of the human bladder because after that you'll need to get up and take a bathroom break mm. so i think that there are these 10 people in the room and i'm telling them a story and three out of them need to get up and take a bathroom break but they don't interrupt me and they don't get up and they sit there 
and hear the story because the story is so riveting. Mm. Ultimately, that's what you need to visualize as a storyteller. Yeah. That how do you get someone to turn the page? You know, we keep talking about how modern day education doesn't uh, serve the needs of a modern day professional. The one big professional skill that I realized was very crucial later on in my career was storytelling. Absolutely. If you can begin to tell stories at 22, 23, it is going to be such an edge for you in terms of making money as well, in terms of, of professional success. Learn to speak through stories. That's right. It just makes you a better communicator. The Absolutely. core of good communication is storytelling. They, they say, no, that the shortest distance between two people is a story. Mm. So the easiest way to reach you is by 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 giving you a story. Which brings me back to PM Modi. You may love him, you may hate him, you may have your own opinions about his political ideologies, Amit Shah's political ideologies. But as you said earlier on this podcast, that the politics of today is the history of tomorrow. Yeah. I strongly anticipate people are going to look back at PM Modi and say that, listen, this is a person who rose to power because of his ability to do the good storytelling. I mean, that's, that's how he gripped see, an see, entire nation. See, think about this. Did Winston Churchill go out and fight World War II? Mm. He didn't. I mean, all it required was for him to say that all I have to offer you is blood, sweat, toil and tears. Mm. And he was able to, he was able to muster up the support of the entire country. I mean, if you look at Churchill, he was the greatest storyteller of them all. Mm. You may hate the guy because of the fact that he... When the Bengal famine happened and his secretaries from India wrote to him saying that millions are dying, he wrote in the margins, has Gandhi died yet or not? Mm. I mean, this was the man. Mm. But does that take away from the fact that he was a great storyteller? Mm. Uh, so, uh, on, but on the, the flip side of Winston Churchill is that Adolf Hitler was also a great storyteller. Mm. And so as a result of which he could take the country into a complete damnation as it were. Mm. So ultimately stories are there whether they result in good or whether they result in bad. Wo niyat jo hai can never be revealed by the story. Mm. It's a means. Yeah. It, you can take it, you can take it, you can use the story to spin something very, very positive and you can spin it into something very, very negative. Wo ek purani, jise kehte wo kahawat hai, sheer hai, ki bhai, wo nazar badlo, to nazare badal jate hai, soch badlo, to sitare badal jate hai. So, you, you can, in some ways, we don't realize what the power of thought is. Yeah. You know, which is also why I always encourage people to read Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. He's highlighted... One of the best books ever. Ever. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes we get criticized on the show for bringing up that book and that writer so why? much. Because I... See, my belief is that you should read a few books in your life and read them well and try retaining everything. Yeah. Uh, subject to the fact that there, there should be that many heavy books. And yeah. I've read a couple of his books, bo both of which have been incredibly heavy and have given me so much just as a human mind. Yeah. Which is why I keep directing people to you, Alnoa Harari. Yeah. Speaking about the concept of storytelling, he's spoken about how when human beings were evolving from cavemen, a big part of our journey of evolution was when we began to actually tell stories. Because yep. stories had this ability to grip groups of people. Of course. And bring people together towards a collective task. And that That's was right. the origins of religion as well. Of course. The Ramayana, for example. Uh, you have such completely different narratives within each version of the Ramayana. But the core... The core objective still remains that duty above all else. Mm. Uh, dharm. Mm. Uh, because if you look at, let's say, uh, the original Valmiki Ramayana, Ram is not uh, an avatar of Vishnu. He's just a human being. Uh, but by the time you come to the Tulsi Ramayana, uh, he's become a Vishnu avatar. Mm. Uh, and he can do in some ways no wrong. Uh, uh, He's Maryada Purushottam. Uh, and similarly, if you take, let's say, for example, other versions, like, for example, the Anand Ramayana, the Adbhud Ramayana, uh, uh, the, you know, in, if, in, in some of the versions you have, for example, uh, the, the final killing of Ravan is not happening uh, at the hands of uh, Ram. Uh, it is happening 
uh, at the hands of Sita, who has manifested herself as Durga, and then eventually kills Ravan. Uh, it, you have a version known as the Jain Ramayan. In the Jain Ramayan, it's Lakshman who kills Ravan. Mm. Uh, or, for example, you have you have the uh, the the Lao Ramayan, which is the Buddhist Ramayan, in which Ram is a Bodhisattva. So each one narrated their story from their own angle, from their own perspective. But that didn't take away from the essence of what that story was trying to convey to you. Mm. It was C.S. Lewis who said that a myth is a lie that reveals a truth. All myths are ultimately made up. But what they are trying to convey to you is a deeper truth. Mm. And that is what makes mythology so fascinating. Mm. But in my case, for me, my storytelling has become exciting because I'm again going to make a small diversion here. I had just written my first novel, uh, The Rose of Line, and I'd been invited by a university in Kolkata. Uh, and uh, I finished my lecture and I had a little time on my hand in the afternoon because my flight was the next morning. So I told my driver, I said, take me to some interesting place. So he said, Saab, mandir dekhenge. Now, if you're in Kolkata, it is taken for granted he is going to take you to a Durga temple, Kali Mandir. He took me to a temple. Um, the road was known as Sridhar Roy Road. We stopped outside a very unassuming structure. We walked in. It, had, it was about the size of this room. Four bare walls, whitewashed. In the middle of the room, there was a green colored throne, marble throne. And there were people there lighting agarbattis, doing aarti, uh, chanting prayers. And uh, Ranveer, uh, I um, sat there, watched this for a while. And then when I looked closely, I realized that on the throne, there was a portrait of Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> so unassuming driver had taken me to an Amitabh Mandir. <laughs> and on that throne, there was a pair of... Uh, Shoes that had been used by Amitabh in the shooting of Kuli. Wow. So I pinched myself. I thought to myself, is this real? Or have I entered into some alternate dimension? Are these guys for real? I came out of the mandir uh, and I was waiting for my car to pick me up. And a little boy uh, had a basket and which contained agarbattis and pool and phal and Prashad, uh, actually meant for people who were going in. Uh, I had not seen him while going in, but I saw him while coming out. He came mm. and said, Saab, aap kuch le lijiye. I picked up only one thing from him. It was a small little book, uh, a prayer booklet. It was known as the Amitabh Chalisa. Huh? <laughs> the Amitabh Chalisa. <laughs> One day I will read it out to you. So uh, instead of the Hanuman Chalisa, it is the Amitabh Chalisa. And I was thinking to myself, I said, okay, Ashwin, now you're standing here outside this pandir and you're waiting for the car to come and pick you up. Now, what in case your car comes at a very high speed mm. and he is unable to slam on the brakes and you get knocked down and you die on the spot. And now, as per the law of karma, you take birth a thousand years later. And a thousand years later, the cult of Amitabh worship has really caught on. Now there isn't one temple dedicated to Amitabh. There are one million temples dedicated to Amitabh. He is treated as a great, great god. And someone taps you on the shoulder and asks you the question, do you think that Amitabh could have been a real historical figure? Now today, Today we know that he is a historical figure, that he exists. But a thousand years from today, he has acquired a mythological status. Mm. So we question, could he be real? Mm. And for me, that is that lovely, tantalizing, what if question. That what if something were real? Mm. So 
we are asking ourselves today about Ram and Krishna. But would 300 versions of the Ramayana have been written in case there wasn't some great man who did something very great which resulted in his story being told. Mm. And with every successive telling, people layered on their own ideas, their own perspectives. So as a result of which it became very difficult to separate fact from fiction. Mm. Amitabh Bachchan's brand and his power comes from a place of being a part of a ton of beautiful fictional stories, Correct. which we call Amitabh Bachchan movies. Correct. But they're the stories that stay in people's heads. That's why Bollywood stands where it stands in our country as a part of our country's culture. Yes. Fiction is a weapon which can be used by the PM of the country to drive narratives. It can be used as the uh, kind of core behind religion starting out. Yes. And it is a human skill that begins with storytelling in the now. If of you're 22, course. 23, learn to tell good stories. By the time you're 30, learn to sell good stories. Yes. I, I think... I, I think whether, frankly, I don't see the divide between fact and fiction uh, because a lot of the stuff that we consider as fact is actually fiction. I mean, for example, I wrote the book Chanakya's Chant. Uh, most of my research uh, for Chanakya's Chant came from an, a Sanskrit play known as Mudra Rakshas. And Mudra Rakshas was written almost 700 years after the lifetime mm. of Kautilya. Mm. Uh, and it was written as a play that was meant to be performed on stage. So what if, what if Vishaka Datta, the author of the Mudra Rakshas, was today was that time's Ashwin Sanghi, mm. who was taking little bit of fact, little bit of fiction, and mixing it up, and in order to spin a grip, a good yarn. Mm. So in that sense, even the books that have engrossed you, you talked about sapiens, but ultimately that was also a bloody good story mm. because it was, it, it kept you hooked. Collection of good stories. But it kept you hooked. Mm. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Mm. When I'm writing a novel, I ask my editor from time to time to read it in, in the interim stages. And at that point of time, I don't ask them, is the grammar right or is, is, is the language right? I'm saying, did you turn the page or did the page turn itself? <laughs> if you had to turn the page, then that means I'm not doing a good job as a writer. It should be an automatic process where you feel compelled. So people ask me, Arey, what does it take to become a bestseller? I say three simple, very rule, three simple rules. And it does, it's not rocket science. The first paragraph should be like a Mumbai pothole. The reader should fall into that pothole with very little chance of getting out. So you've trapped your reader into that story. In James Patterson's case, he says, put a dead body in page one. <laughs> so it's essentially get the person sucked into your web. Second, every chapter should end on a hook. A hook which forces him to get propelled into the next chapter. And your final paragraph of the book should be a sense of contentment, should make a person feel that the all the pending issues have got resolved. But most importantly, for a best-selling author, it should make someone look out for your next book. Because then that will keep the cycle going. Mm. So I think all of those three are very, very simple but they need to be emphatically and religiously and persistently followed through. I would say is that even if you do succeed, your book gets published, you become successful, people, you have a legion of adoring fans, the royalty checks become very, very interesting. Don't leave your feet off the ground. Let mm -hmm. Keep your feet on the ground. Remember that every word that you put down on that piece of paper were not from you, they were through you. Mm. It was Ma Saraswati who was guiding your hand with every word that you penned. Wow. Ashwin Sanghi sir, thank you. Uh, thank you for getting me into the habit of reading, firstly. I don't think I thanked you for that 
till this moment and that's what i was holding back when we were having a conversation outside thank you ranveer i'm delighted i always get excited by the fact that when i come for interviews or talks and there are young people by my yardstick you are young because there is about 20 odd years that separates us but when people come to me and they say that you know you you either inspired me to pick up my first book or that a particular book changed my way of thinking or that it inspired me to read another book which uh, uh which you had referred to in your original novel i'll tell you the excitement that it gives to me when i hear those words is more than the excitement of the cash registers ringing let me just add an anecdote here um lots of people at our motivational talks ask us about how to get into habit of reading and as a motivational speaker you usually speak from your own experience yeah. in terms of this is what i helped me i think this is what will help you so whenever someone asks me that question chanakya's chant flashes in my head and i ask myself what did i like in that book today you answer it which is your kind of methodical storytelling and just whatever you put inside but there was some magic in that book that got me into the habit of reading you know you'll be surprised since you since you talked about chanakya's chant it's important for me to tell you that for most people the story emerges from a from a moment of flash there's a flash so for example the rozabal line i i was on a chance visit in shrinagar and uh my driver took me to the shrine in the heart of shrinagar and then there is a body which is laid out in the north south axis islamic burial but there is a previous burial which is underneath it which is east west outside the tomb there is a carving which shows a pair of human feet with crucifixion marks and it just got me so excited that wow could the story of christ in india be real but with chanakya's chant it was the 2000 and 2009 general election and i was wondering i said politics is so messy in this country but was politics always so messy we talk of the good old days but were the good old days really good <laughs> and uh, you know that there, there are there is, it was who, i think it was sunzu who said no that uh, politics is merely war without bloodshed mm. so in that sense i was wondering that today's politics could be equated to ancient warfare the only difference is the lack of blood mm. uh and that got me thinking that okay if today chanakya existed in today's world what would that chanakya look like and that resulted in the story of uh chanakya's chant but what i realized was that what was most important was that the vast majority of people who were reading that story for them it was their very first exposure to chanakya through my novel people hadn't read the mudra rakshas they had not read the arthashastra they had not read the niti shastra their first exposure to chanakya was through chanakya's chant and that's when i realized that this play between fact and fiction and not knowing when you have switched from fact into fiction and fiction into fact is a very very tantalizing possibility mm. uh and i think that's what makes most of these books uh so readable yeah. because of the fact that they play on that what if question what if krishna was real what if the mahabharat really happened what in case our ancient seers were actually looking into the very same concepts that quantum theorists are looking into mm. so that that is a very delicious conspiracy question what if maybe it's a nice way to end this particular episode as well sir because i know that the next time we're going to be recording this that's what we're going to be tapping into all the quantum physics uh, overlaps with like the ancient indian culture but for this episode sir thank you i think we touched upon a lot of different topics and the audience got a nice kind of intro to everything that you have accumulated in terms of knowledge throughout your life thank you so much ranveer it's been a pleasure being on your show and god bless you and thank may you this show us. continue to rake in millions of visitors not that you need them you already have a tremendous fan following of your own but i I hope and I wish and I pray Thanks. that Ma Saraswati continues to bless you. Thanks. Thank you sir. It means a lot. Might just end this episode with a uh, Mahavidya Mahavani Shruti Smriti Pradayani Shakcha Saraswati Devi Jeeva Agre Vastu Mo Jeeva Agre Vasme Nityam Sarvavidya Sada Prada Shade Shade Devi Namaste Nyan Deshu Bari.
That was the episode for today. While I learned a lot from Sir, these are some of the questions I've always wanted to ask him. But when I met him in person, what struck me was his happiness levels, was how comfortable he was with his entire life, how comfortable he was with his own mind. And comfort is always an outcome of wisdom. That's what I got through this podcast, the wisdom of one of India's most celebrated authors. Remember, guys, for more wisdom like this, follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Lots of episodes with established mainstream Indian and international authors coming up on The Ranveer Show.